Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CID speaker series. My name is Sarah Luttrell, and I'm the Communications and Events Manager at the Center for International Development here at Harvard University. I look forward to today's discussion with the authors of the World Bank's Fragility and Conflict Report. The format for today's discussion, as in all of our other discussions, is about a 20 to 25 minute presentation, and we'll leave around 15 minutes for Q&A. And before we get started, I also want to just mention a few housekeeping items. So during the Q&A session, you can submit your questions directly to the chat or by using the raise your hand function if you'd like to ask your questions directly to the speakers. Um, our CID student ambassador, Rohit Subramanian, is going to moderate today's Q&A session. Uh, so hi, Rohit, thanks for joining. Uh, we're also recording today's session uh, and this video will be available on CID's YouTube channel after the event. I will add links uh, in the chat to sign up for our newsletter to hear about uh, other events like this. Um, and we also ask that you please, if you are able, to put on your video so that the speakers are not speaking to an empty room. It's nice for them to be able to see some faces while they're presenting. So we appreciate that if you're able. Um, our next speaker series event is on Friday, April 30th. So next Friday with Kate Raworth. Uh, she is an economist and the co-founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab. And this is the last <laughs> speaker series event of the semester. So we hope that you will join us. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Uh, they're all economists and authors of the World Bank's Fragility and Conflict Report. Uh, so we have Paul Coral, Nandini Krishnan, Daniel Gerson Mahler, and Tara Vishwanath. So thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, we're all looking very forward and Tara, I will pass it over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, is everyone able to hear me? So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and thank you for joining us today for this presentation. As Sarah said, it's on fragility and conflict uh, and violent, violence affected countries. So why did we do this work? I mean, for those of you who don't know the World Bank, you know, the World Bank's ultimate objective in terms of the lending and non-lending work that is done by this institution is to actually improve welfare and reduce poverty around the world, right? That's the ultimate objective. So what we wanted to do is to document all the welfare challenges that are faced by people living in conditions of fragility, conflict, and violence. Fragile countries are often characterized by weak governance and institutions, uh, very limited health systems, which is coming to the fore, right? It's coming to play during the COVID crisis and very, very poor service delivery. These are all very basic things you need to actually, you know, live as opposed to not, right? And they significantly increase the vulnerability, I think, as we are witnessing the, the, the global epidemic, right? This whole COVID across the globe. So uh, imagine that even in this context, uh, advanced countries are grappling with an un unprecedented scale, right? So food security is massively, insecurity is massively increased in the US, you know, to take one marker of welfare. So can you imagine what would happen to countries who are already in the state prior to the crisis? The other case for, uh, for, uh, for the work, and you'll hear from the presenters, uh, or Daniel and Paul who will do much of the presentation is that we have a huge problem with data to inform policy and programming in these contexts for very obvious reasons, right? When a country is in conflict, it's difficult to collect, monitor. So that's a huge cry we make because as researchers, as people like you who study in universities, I mean, you have to, these are the kind of things that are particularly important and interesting in the way we have, uh, you see, I see this sort of work being done in. Uh, in academic institutions as well. So uh, now going to the next slide, I'll, I'll do the first slide here, and then I will basically hand over to Daniel. So, uh, so basically, I think, you know, what you see, what do you see in this chart, right? What you see is basically um, uh, a million, on the left-hand side, you, you have time on the horizontal axis, and um, uh, now millions of people on the vertical, right? And we measure poverty in a particular way. It's called purchasing power parity. Essentially, crudely put, it's the ratio of prices for a basket of goods, right? For countries so that you can compare purchasing power, right? What does a dollar in PPP terms in Ghana or India buy you? 
right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's framed around that. So what you see is a remarkable reduction in this, uh, in the, in, in this, uh, in this context of extreme poverty around the globe, right? We basically halved it up to 2017. We're, we're looking at data, which is all now pre-COVID, right? And what you also see, sadly, on the right-hand side of the gra uh, uh, graph is millions of, you know, the millions of people living in close proximity to conflict, right? Over the same time period, what we're seeing is that has, you know, gone from about 99 million, right, or, or thereabouts in, in 2007, and that's more than doubled, right, uh, in, in, in 2017. So what you're going to hear in this talk is, this is, this is an, you know, a, 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 an, an important thing because people living in or close to conflict affected or fragile situations are going to face particular problems, as I said earlier, right? In terms of being able to uh, cope with or being the governments being able to address issues related to, you know, conf uh, welfare broadly defined, right? So that's what the talk is gonna be about. It's gonna, it's gonna frame it around that and end with ways in which we can think about giving a more, more concrete flesh to uh, the notion of fragility and how we can help advance uh, the cause of people living in these environments or more importantly to prevent. It's a very humbling thought, but how do we prevent fragility and conflict? It should be the ultimate objective. And I think the book exposes the very humbling sort of, you know, framework within which we can actually do that. So over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Tara. Um, so, so as Tara mentioned, we, we really want to get at these two concepts on, on each side of the slide jointly. So, so how does welfare and poverty look for people uh, that are experiencing uh, conflict and violence? And um, when trying to do so, we, we immediately run into a, a data deprivation problem, as Tara also alluded to. Essentially, when we study poverty, we rely on household surveys that are often carried out by national statistical offices. And you can imagine that if it's dangerous to be in part of the country, it's going to be hard to carry out these surveys. And at the same time, if there is a lot of institutional fragility in a country, the national statistical office might not have the capabilities to conduct uh, high quality household surveys. So, so we identify in general three types of data deprivations for international poverty uh, estimates in FCS and here FCS is World Bank speak for countries in fragile and conflict affected settings. So there are about 74 million people living in countries which have no international poverty estimates at all. About 400 million people living in countries with outdated poverty estimates. So this could be, take for example, Syria, where the latest knowledge we have about international poverty in the country is from 2004. You can all imagine that that number is not very informative about what's going on in the country today. And finally, we systematically lack poverty data and IDPs and refugees. As these household surveys I mentioned, the sampling frame often excludes IDPs and refugees or don't deal with them properly, meaning that they're not captured in global poverty counts. So altogether, this means that, you know, if we wanna study poverty and conflict jointly, we are struck by this problem that for more than half a billion people or equivalent to seven out of 10 of the people we're, we're interested in studying, we don't really have appropriate data. Obviously there are data deprivations uh, for people that are in countries not in FCS as well, but it's typically much smaller, um, only three out of 10 people. So, so really the first, the first task we have to figure out is somehow overcome these data deprivations and just spend one slide explaining how we do so, and then we'll get to some of the results. So for economies with no poverty estimates at all, we're trying to predict their poverty rates using data from national accounts and nightlights. For economies with outdated poverty estimates, the way we tend to do uh, things in the World Bank is that say we have data for a country from 2015 and we know that GDP per capita since then grew by 10%. Well, then we're gonna make the very simple assumption that everyone's income or consumption since 2015 grew according to the growth rate in GDP per capita. So here by 10%. And it turns out that very simple assumption works quite well for countries not in conflict. So what you will see in this figure is that for all the poverty data we have at the World Bank, uh, 
on average, the growth in GDP per capita, if, it, if GDP per capita grows by 1%, the kind of consumption or income we observe in household surveys would grow by 0.96%. So, so just the one-to-one -one mapping is, is you know, a somewhat admissible assumption. But when we look at countries in conflict, there's really a disconnect between growth in GDP per capita and growth in consumption or income as observed in household surveys. This could be because GDP spending in those countries reflect military spending. It could be because of corruption. It could be because there's a lot of rebuilding of infrastructure that doesn't trickle down to household consumption. For, it could be for all kinds of reasons. It just means that it's harder for us to project outdated poverty estimates forward. But what we do here is we take this absurd relationship and just weaken the relationship between GDP per capita growth and growth in, in household services as we observe it. And through that, we can get more recent poverty estimates for countries with outdated data. Finally, to deal with lack of poverty data for IDPs and refugees, we exploit the fact that we do have data for a handful of countries on, on poverty for IDPs and refugees. We sort of compare the income and consumption of IDPs and refugees with non-IDPs in these countries and the relationship that we that we uncover, we apply to other IDPs around the world. And through that, we can sort of back out uh, some estimates of poverty among IDPs and refugees. To say that all of these assumptions are clearly second best and uh, and the ideal, uh, the ideal outcome is to get more data. Uh, and that's indeed um, something we're working very hard on at the bank to get more data on, on welfare for for countries in FCS and refugees. But with those assumptions, we can get a, a timely picture of poverty all over the world. And, and that's what we show here. Before getting into the figure, let me just remind everyone how we measure poverty very quickly. This will be familiar to some of you, but we're in this figure and in the, in the coming slides, we're looking at, at extreme poverty using the international poverty line, which is currently at $1.90 a day. Um, which is a very frugal standard. And, and briefly, this line is what the typical, what, a, what the poorest countries in the world typically themselves define as their poverty line. And that is based on meeting basic nutritional uh, needs and some other very basic needs such as shelter and, and clothing. So it's, it's really a, a frugal standard and being below $1.90 uh, is, is why we call it extreme poverty. You can be poor and have an income or consumption above $1.90. But with this standard, then what do we see? Well, we see that the poorest 43 economies in the world are all in countries suffering from fragility or conflict or in sub-Saharan Africa. And obviously there will be some countries that are in both of these uh, groupings. So, so really what we, what we see on the top of the slide, not sure if you can, can see it for the header, is that the war on poverty can only be won if we focus on economies in FCS and in Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the question might be is whether this picture has changed over time. Um, so we can look at the millions of poor in countries not in FCS and in FCS since year 2000. What you'll see here is that in year 2000, four out of five of the global poor were not in countries in FCS. But growth in India and China and other countries has meant that poverty in those countries has decreased rapidly while it stagnated or increased for countries in FCS. Such that today we actually estimate that more than half of the world's poor live in countries suffering from fragile and conflict affected situations. And this continues as many as two thirds of the, of the world's poor might live in such situations. So again, we say eliminating extreme poverty requires an urgent focus on, on countries in FCS. You might ask, how do, how do we know what countries are in conflict in 2030? Obviously we don't. Here we assume that the countries that are in conflict today continue to be so over the next 10 years. And a very rough assumption, but it's hard to predict a future conflict. One thing to keep in mind with this number is that only about 10% of the world's population actually lives in countries in FCS. So, so it means that we're expecting that in 2030, two thirds of the world's poor live in countries that only make up 10% of the world's population. That's really a bimodal world where some countries are suffering from high poverty and conflict and some countries neither. <laughs> 
Now, obviously, countries and conflict and fragility differ. And you, in the report, we're trying to break them down according to different groups in various ways. Here, I'll just show you one way in which we do it, which is according to how often they've been in conflict or fragility over the past 10, 20 years, using what we call the FCS list, which is the World Bank's official list for classifying countries according to conflict and fragility. So we'll work with one group of countries that have been in conflict or fragility over the past 20 years systematically, some that entered conflict, some that went in and out, some that escaped, and some that never were. And on the left, you'll see the, the poverty rates for these five country groupings. So what you'll notice if you look at the gray or green line is that the countries never in FCS or that escaped FCS have seen really impressive declines in extreme poverty. On the other hand, if you look at the orange line or the red line, countries that entered FCS or chronically in FCS have seen stagnations or increases in poverty to the point where today, if you live in a country in chronic FCS, we expect there's a 40% probability that you are in extreme poverty. Now, so far we've been talking about monetary poverty and we know that's not all that matters to people, particularly not people that are that have suffered from conflict and violence. They might suffer from lack of access to basic services from trauma or from poor health due to the conflict. So we're trying also to look at what the situation it's like if we look at a broader concept of poverty. And here concretely, we look at the World Bank's multidimensional poverty measure, which is based on OFI's uh, multidimensional poverty index. And next to incorporating monetary poverty, it also incorporates uh, indicators on education, access to water, electricity, and more. When we use that broader measure of poverty, we find that half of people in FCS are in poverty, so even more than with monetary poverty, showing that really uh, that people in, in conflict and fragile affected settings often suffer from multiple um, dimensions of deprivations at once. Finally, we're also looking at the welfare uh, of people in FCS based on health and education indicators, particularly based on the World Bank's human capital index. And you'll see here each row is as one indicator of health and education. And what we do here is we rank all the world's countries according to how they fare and divide them into economies not in FCS, economies in FCS and economies in high intensity conflict, which is based on a definition of how many battle deaths they had per 100,000 the past year. What you see is across the board, economies in FCS have worse health and education outcomes and it's even worse for economies in high intensity conflict. So really this picture we saw with monetary poverty, it duplicates to other dimensions of well-being. And this one perhaps is particularly concerning given that it often, many of these indicators deal with kids, meaning that the consequences of conflict might last generations. That's indeed what uh, Paul will turn to next. Thank you so much, Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here. Uh, so human capital consists of the knowledge, skills, and, and health that people accumulate over their lives. And, and so it often matters to us because this is often one of the few uh, resources that the poor actually have. Um, and so even short conflicts harming, harm the welfare, uh, well-being for a lifetime. Uh, and human capital accumulation requires a sustained political commitment, adequate and timely resource mobilization, a whole of society approach, so to speak, and an effective use of data and measurements. All of these features, which are seldomly present in economies grappling with fragility, conflict, and violence. Shocks such as armed conflict, natural disasters, or pandemics can have a long lasting impact on human capital. Some of the manners in which these shocks affect human capital are obvious. For example, battle deaths and casualties of natural disasters or disease. Additionally, damage to critical infrastructure and institutions and the loss of skills experienced by the displaced can also have lasting impacts. However, evidence suggests that conflict may affect ch children's health in the long run. Uh, so what you see here is a couple of the studies that we that we did uh, that we reviewed, and Akresh and co-authors find that those affected in the Nigerian civil war 
were on average shorter than those cohorts which weren't ex as exposed to the conflict. Now, shorter stature is often associated with reduced life, to life expectancy and lower lifetime earnings. Fadera, on the other hand, finds in Nepal that women exposed to the 1996 to 2006 civil conflict exhibited lower stature. Fadera also found that the, mod, that the mother's exposure to conflict in her childhood is also detrimental to her children. The author suggests that this outcome is likely because of the mother's inability to invest in a child's early development and thus propagates the effects of conflict across generations. Next slide, please, Daniel. And so by compromising human capital, conflict attacks the very roots of resilience and economic potential. The impact on human capital is worsened with increased conflict severity. Bertoni and co-authors study the impact of the Boko Haram conflict in Northeast Nigeria on school enrollment and educational attainment. The authors find that increased conflict severity in proximity to the child's village of residence reduces the likelihood of the child being enrolled in school during the next school period. Bindervet and Franzen in Rwanda find that in utero exposure to the, Ru to the Rwandan genocide reduced educational attainment by almost a third of a year. And kids were also less likely to complete primary school. Leon in Peru finds that exposure to violence in utero adversely affects the educational attainment beyond the direct effect, effect of violent conflict, giving further evidence that shocks during the early stages of life have long run and often irreversible consequences on an individual's welfare. Next slide, please. Conflict is also associated with lower intergenerational mobility. The higher the number of conflict deaths to which an individual is exposed before or during their primary school age, the lower the, prob the probability they will attain high a higher educational level, level than both their parents. And so on the left-hand side on the, on the graph on the left, you can see the share, with share of children or individuals with more education than both parents. Taking educational attainment as a rough proxy for socioeconomic status, this means that individuals' rates of absolute intergenerational mobility decline as the intensity of their childhood conflict exposure rises. Individuals exposed to no conflict deaths during their childhood have on average roughly 55% chance of surpassing both their parents' educational level. Individuals exposed to high degrees of conflict Defined, uh, defined as 10,000 conflict deaths per 100,000 people, have around a 40% chance of surpassing their parents' educational level. Not only that, but on the graph on the right, you can see this, the rank correlation on, on how the socioeconomic rank of those exposed to conflict deaths is likely to be determined by those of their parents. Individuals residing in countries without many conflict deaths, by the time they exit primary school, are able to obtain outcomes rather independent from their parents with a correlation between parents and children's outcomes of about 0.4. Next slide, please, Daniel. So Iraq, Iraq and Vietnam provide a very interesting case study. In Iraq, which you can see the figure on the left, the 1980 to 1988 Iran-Iraq war and the ensuing 1990 to 1991 Gulf War implied that cohorts born before or about 1969 were able to finish primary school without being affected by conflict, while later cohorts were affected by this conflict. Vietnam's war with the United States from 1955 to 1975 implied that early cohorts were impacted by war, while later cohorts were not. In Iraq, prior to the start of the conflicts, absolute mobility was in an upward trend. As you can see here, the share of education, uh, share of children, share of individuals with more education than both parents, was was trailing upwards, going up from 25 percent roughly in 1940 up to 60 percent by 1970. In the decades that followed, the rate continued falling because of the conflict, or what is what we the relationship that we can assume here. Thus, individuals born in 1990 had a similar absolute mobility to that observed in, co in cohorts from 1950. 
In Vietnam, we can observe a similar but mirror picture. People who completed school before the war with the US had a very high probability of surpassing their parents' education levels. In the decades that followed, this number dropped to roughly 65%. And once the war ended, after a couple of decades, the number has crept up to over 85%. And in fact, now Vietnam is one of the countries with one of the highest human capital indexes in the world. Next slide, please, Daniel. So prevention relies on identifying markers of fragility early. And clustering is a, is a method that we can use to provide some types of, so by these type of in, insights. By acting soon and effectively, or through prevention, the irreversible losses that we've highlighted before, hopefully can be mitigated. So how do we go about this? We would like to identify certain markers of fragility, not necessarily to predict conflict, but to be able to get insights into what we could or should be looking out for. We think that clustering is the way that we can get that information. Clustering, which is a data-driven exercise to find patterns of similarity or dissimilarity, can, can be used here. It is one approach that we can use to identify countries at risk of becoming FCS because we find that they have markers similar to other countries who are currently on the list. We focus on key markers of fragility, which mimic the FCS criteria used by the World Bank and by other institutions. This results in a creation of six country clusters or country groupings. And so while we can only visualize two dimensions at a time, these are in fact incorporated all simultaneously, but some clear patterns are already evident in some two by two uh, scatter plots as we can see. And so the resulting green clusters that you see on the upper right hand side in, in, the, in, the, in all the figures except for the lower left one are generally performing well and not at risk. They are mostly high income countries and also happen to identify countries doing well, well in terms of government effectiveness, voice, voice and accountability, as well as stability uh, with little, little violence. On the other hand, the dark X's, the dark red X's are on the other extreme with poor governance and high violence. In these slides, as you will see, we have standardized all our included covariates or variables so that the global average is zero. And thus everything is measured in standard deviations away from that global average. You can see on the right-hand side of the slide, the different components that we've included into the exercise. And we move to the next slide, please, Daniel. And so I'm gonna start with, with, the, with, the, with the groupings that, that perhaps most as, are most associated to fragility as, as we have in mind. Uh, and so natural resources and poor governance along with ethnic fractionalization are a very potent mix. So let's start with group five, which is the one on the left-hand side. There are 34 economies that are classified in the group. It has a lower than average governance and above, and a, and an above average share of GDP from natural resources, along with a higher average ethnic fractionalization. Out of the 34 countries, 11 is, are classified as FCS. Countries on the list which aren't currently on the list, but bear watching since they are the most similar to FCS countries in the group are perhaps Angola, Azerbaijan, Equatorial Guinea. As one can see, some of the countries in the list are large oil producing countries. Now, group six has the worst govern governance indicators of the law. They have worse governance indicators than those in group five. And it's average high ethnic fractionali fractionalization. And, and it also has a very high uh, share of GDP from natural resources. They are similar to those of group five. Thus, what really marks the difference in this group is the high number of battle deaths. This group is made up entirely of FCS classified countries. Five of those are chronically, are chronic FCS uh, countries, meaning that they have been on the list for a very long time. And other three are those who, that have recently joined. Can we move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, and so the wide diversity of salient markers among the other groups really bears watching. So for example, uh, 
Group two stands out due to the high homicide rate in the country. It is made up of 14 countries. Among those are some Latin American countries are on the list. Uh, and, and four countries in the list are actually those with the highest homicide rates. Now, this doesn't mean that other high homicide rates should be on the list. It just means that the homicide rate for these countries is just so high that it puts them on the list while the others isn't high enough. Uh, countries in the list that bear watching, for example, are some, some in Central America and others in South America. Now, group four is made up of countries hosting large refugee populations relative to their own. Two of the countries in that list are classified as FCS. Now, some, I might caveat this here because while hosting a high refugee population is the defining characteristic of the group, there's little evidence that this fa factor actually poses a fragility, a fragility risk. Instead, the group, this group highlights the potential risks associated with neighborhood effects, especially those associated with protracted displacement. Now, group three is made up of 61 countries. This is the largest group of them, of them all. And the countries in the group are very diverse. A few of the countries in the group are currently classified as FCS. These have below average governance indicators and some are in the upper part of the distribution in regards to battle deaths. It is, it's for some of these, because they have a high battle death number, you would expect them to be in group six. However, the number of battle deaths isn't sufficiently large. So for example, Sudan is in this group. Outside of those in group six, it has the highest number of battle deaths. That value, however, is only half a standard deviation above the mean. Whereas for the next economy in the distribution, it is two standard deviations. So there's a big gap between those and that's why it's classified here. Next slide, please, Daniel. In this slide, you can see a global map with the different groupings and the different classifications. I'm just gonna leave it up there for a little while so that you guys can uh, digest the information just for a little while. Okay, <laughs> moving on. And so, the whole point of this is that in reality, ending extreme poverty by 2030 won't be achieved if we can't address uh, the implications on welfare from FCB countries. Uh, and so it's very difficult to act, as Daniel has noted, it's very difficult to act if we don't know where action is needed. Thus, identifying early points for mitigating risk and limiting negative spillovers will need the right data at the right time. However, as Daniel collect, uh, mentioned, collecting data in these contexts is not easy. Thus, in not innovative collection methods and uses of data need to be implemented for these cases. Moreover, there's limited data at the local level, which can actually support nuanced diagnostics, as conflicts as are often focused subnationally, especially when they first erupt. Because conflict impacts multiple dimensions of welfare and human capital, we need a coordinated package of interventions to address the overlapping welfare deprivations. Civil society and other stakeholders must work in conjunction to coordinate their interventions and ensure that needs are addressed with hierarchy of necessity in mind. And borrowing from Leo Tolstoy, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unique in its own way. As we've seen, a variety of the attributes can lead to a country to fragility. We need interventions that are tailor-made to each circumstance, which is informed by country-specific analytics. Protecting and rebuilding human capital in, fra in fragile and conflict situations is crucial. To restore hope in these countries, human capital is often the only asset at the disposal of vulnerable populations. They are also essential ingredients to reach our global poverty goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all. Thank you, Tara. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Paul. That was extremely um, excellent presentation and actually changes the narrative on poverty and the way we talk and think about poverty in the coming decade, for sure.
um, we'll open it up to questions. Um, I can see there's one question already um, it's waiting for you guys. But just before that, I, I would love to just get your thoughts on how the World Bank is thinking about uh, poverty reduction programs and and its efforts in this in this vein in the coming decade. And does it systematically and fundamentally change from how poverty reduction was sort of targeted by the World Bank, um, you know, since 2000? Because it, it seems like, especially the way Daniel described it, we will live in a bimodal world where two thirds of poverty is concentrated in just 10% of the population. So it, it almost seems like thinking about it in, in, in a very different way. Um, so we'd love to hear, hear your thoughts on that. So, I, so Rohit, I'll start. And uh, certainly, I'm sure other people from the team will have many views, right? So as I said in the introduction, it's a humbling thought, right? So just finding out that, oh, you know, countries have made, uh, you know, huge progress, right, in their structural policy environment. If I go back 10, 20 years, you know, India, China was contributing a hell of a lot, right, but the sheer weight of their population, right? So now what you're seeing is there's a huge policy uh, environment, right? The dynamism that's come into, you know, lots of stories on the East Asian miracle driven by the export based, you know, programs in China, all of that stuff, right? So it, this is a natural thing, right? So it's, it's really the concentration of the poor in these sorts of environments is telling you a story where we say that the next, the last mile, if you want to call it that, of, of this sort of elimination of extreme poverty will actually be the hardest because you're dealing with a bunch of countries where you're caught up in this trap, right? Of a, of a very fragile and, and, and con some somewhat conflict affected environment. So what, what, it's humbling, but what we're also doing, there's a huge World Bank strategy at the first of its kind that was written uh, and we kind of wrote this report because of that, right? Because we wanted to underpin that strategy with as much evidence as we could garner, right? So we've, we've kind of not only made the big case for saying, pay a lot of attention to how you do the work as a, in these sorts of environments where it's difficult to do it, right? Uh, that tremendously, some of these things like weak institutions, political and otherwise, are really difficult for an external agency to push, right? Um, so, so I think what we, we have to do is to see if we can uh, do things differently, right? So we, we always helped poverty reduction, improvements in education, health, right? That the program in the World Bank is vibrant and stretches. It's not like the IMF where you look at short-term fiscal stuff, right? So we are widespread anyway. So the biggest thing we are rethinking is two things, right? One is the how part. How can we introduce, you know, and circumvent the implementation, right? Uh, so a lot of the innovation is happening in the how. And on the data side, I think we're in a world now where we're actually, and you people know this better, right? I mean, you're in Harvard. And I think there's a lot of, satellite imagery and other types of data that you're bringing into play. For example, can I predict yield failure that will give me a sense of food security in a very granular space in a country that we can, we can sorry about that, uh, that we can actually, um, you know, use. I'm, I'm shortcutting many things, right? So that's one way we're changing the way we build the evidence. We're changing the way in which we're implementing programs locally. Right? We're also in these kinds of places, take Yemen, we're really working right now, as we speak, there's a currency crisis leading to famine-like, right? So we're a, a situation. So we're actually working also with other partners. So the bank is working with other partners, sometimes community organizations, piggybacking on some of that work. So I can go on and on, but I think as I, even as I say this, it's humbling and evolving and, uh, you know, duly noted that we have a long way to go. That's my view. But uh, anyone else? Can I, can I add two points? Uh, so just building on, on what Sarah said. So, so obviously what, what the data shows is that we should focus more on, on these countries, as you also pointed out, Rohit. But there are, I think, two, two other points also to keep in mind. One is that we can't take past success for granted. And what we're seeing now is the first increase in global poverty in a generation. And a lot of the increase comes from countries not in FCS uh, that have been hit hard, right? Such as India, South Africa, Brazil. Uh, so, so 
even though poverty might be going down there, it, it's not a it's not a sufficient reason to to ignore them. And second, the other objective of the bank, then then eradicate or eliminate extreme poverty by by 2030 is to to boost income of the bottom 40 percent in each country um, in a sustainable manner. So so obviously that's something that would require a focus on on all countries, not just the one in conflict. Even though they they very likely will be the ones that will have the most extreme poor uh, by 2030. Oh, actually, one other point, Rohit, actually is uh, very central to what we're doing in the bank, is actually on the prevention side, there's a huge focus now on the nexus between conflict, right? It's in, uh, sorry, on climate, its effects on, you know, particularly if you take Africa, right, and parts of Asia, you've got a huge uh, way in which that's affecting, uh, you know, productivity, it's affecting incomes, and the, the potentially could intensify or create conflict, right? So there's a huge uh, focus coming into play now in, in, in the nexus between conflict, uh, climate, uh, you know, incomes and conflict and, and the way we can, you know, mitigate some of these uh, potential sort of risks for people who rely on that and for the economy as a whole. So that's a, a very concrete focus that's come into play even more so than it was in the past. Thank you, that's uh, very insightful. Um, anybody who has questions, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Kareem, can I hand it over to you? Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for this presentation. Um, my understanding is that in these countries, basically the root cause of the poverty typically is the underlying political conflict. And, and this is the root cause. So knowing that the World Bank mandate doesn't necessarily extend to cover reducing conflict in the world, I want to understand more the approach of the World Bank in dealing with the root cause. Do you play a role in trying to reduce the conflict? Do you partner with other international organizations to reduce the conflict? Because it seems to me that whatever programs we can do on the economic level, if we do not address the root cause, which is the conflict itself, I think progress will be difficult to, to make. Thank you very much. So firstly, um, I don't think we have compelling evidence, right? That conflict is the root cause of poverty. In fact, there is an issue. It can go both ways. We don't know more, more clearly see that conflict can exacerbate or worsen poverty and welfare more broadly defined, right? The causality the other way is not at all clear, right? So the institution, I mean, at least at the World Bank and many people will tell you that including in academe, if you look at uh, the work that Jay Pal does, you know, your neighbor in MIT, the, uh, the other, the IPA, the institutions that are working on these topics as development economics has become central to development economics research, right? What are you doing is you're basically trying to understand the mechanisms, right? The, the, that cause conflict. So the fact that I have, uh, you know, uh, I have um, a drought, right? Uh, that in itself is not necessarily causing conflict, right? But it could hurt, it is hurting incomes for people, right? There are many parts of the world where a drought uh, disrupts uh, what I produce and smallholder farmers, starting with them, they lose income, right? Now that in itself is not a conflict producing thing, but if it is persistent, right? And, and if, if this is a repeated shock and it affects people, so the economic channel sometimes can create the environment for an exacerbation of conflict, right? And I can give many, many examples. So what we do as an institution in, in one way to put it is we, we kind of look at, are there mechanisms within the policy arena within the economic policy arena? Do I understand the, these linkages enough that if I look at the economic policy arena and help that, right, through a policy dialogue, through designing an intervention, experimenting and demonstrating to government that that is helping. For example, in India, that there's a huge public works program, right, across, the, it's a national program, right? There is recent work that has shown that in many parts of India, which are affected by somewhat by the you know conflict uh, and fragility, the, in, in the, this program 
right? For example, during climate shocks, right? If you take the Western part of this program, during climate shocks, the presence of this program, right? Reduce this volatility in income and you saw less conflict. So you're able to infer that some of these, you know, strategies of mitigating risk was actually helping. So, so the, the, the bank's work is not to, to, first of all, the inference that poverty, you know, root cause of conflict is poverty is not entirely, I can tell you many examples, but that's not true. But we are interested in softening these sorts of vulnerabilities, right? Through programming and policy and hope that if we understand some of the other causes related to these things, we can address them through economic policy dialogue, right? This is, this is a literature that is very nascent, right? The causalities are very unclear. Even the causality between climate and conflict is debated. Right? But certain things that are not debated is the consequences of conflict are dire. Right? You heard in the talk, you can, you can be affected lifelong, intergenerationally. So that is something that is extremely important to bear in mind, even for the quest of prevention. Um, and I can add to that, to what Tara said. This is Nandini. Um, so I think the, uh, the important sort of implication of what Tara said is that in our work in fragile countries, you have to be very careful to do no harm because you don't want to, through the design of your interventions or the policy dialogue, exacerbate some of these pre-existing inequalities, which may be related to both poverty and, and conflict. I think the causal relation between one and the other is not clear. Um, I think you can say probably that conflict is welfare reducing, um, but it's not clear that conflict causes poverty. I know it can be coded, these things can go together often. So, so that's one. I think the second is, is that increasingly, I think the, the World Bank is recognizing that there are uh, places in which uh, working only through sort of government systems does not allow you to reach the entirety of the country. So there has been that increasing recognition of finding different partners. I think Yemen, as Tara said, is a case in point where in the absence of uh, a clear um, counterpart in government, uh, a clear recognized counterpart in government, um, there has been huge effort to sort of work more closely with the humanitarian effort and to get in early uh, with thinking about, a little bit about what, what systems might be that you can bolster so that in the event of a, a more peaceful resolution, you know, you're in a better place than just starting from scratch. Um, so that's a couple of different ways. Uh, but I think being very careful about understanding the local context knowing uh, who the players are in that, in that conflict, which sometimes has localized roots, sometimes has roots in um, a competition over resources, changing climate, and therefore sort of a loss of livelihoods. Being cognizant of all of those things is, is very important. So knowing the country is very important. I think these one size fits all, you know, I think that's one of, the, one of our findings kind of at the macro level when you look at the data, but when you work on a country too, that's equally important. Okay. Great. Thank you all so very much for your insights, uh, your expertise, and for answering all the questions and for all the questions coming in. Uh, it was a really interesting presentation and such important work that you all are doing. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us here today. Uh, and thank you for everyone who was able to attend today. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, having you all, all here, and we hope that you continue uh, looking into this report uh, and read it more for yourself. Um, and our last speaker series, as I said, is next Friday, April 30th with Kate Raworth, uh, economist and co-founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab. So we hope that you will join us for that next event as well. So thank you and we will see you next week. <laughs>